everybody, it's Robert Earl from the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas. Obviously, I'm not at the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas. I'm on the side of Highway 118, which is our road between Alpine, Texas and Big Bend National Park. And I'm sitting here at a rock fall on the side of our big mountain. And the reason I'm here at the rock fall is if we're going to discuss masonry 100 to 199. We have to discuss how to select what masonry, what we are going to use to create the masonry. Could be bottles, which is what I do most of the time. Could be block, could be brick. In this case, it's going to be native rock. And this is some special rock, and I'm going to get into telling you why I feel it's special in a few minutes. But here's what happened. About, about six years ago, we had an earthquake out here. Now, earthquakes are uncommon, but we do get them. And this earthquake, I didn't even feel it. It was something, it was either like a 4.2 or a 4.6. Now there's a huge difference in magnitude between 0.2 and 0.6, but being it's a four point, it wasn't still enough for us to feel. So I didn't feel it, but what it did was it cracked. And you can see the way that uh, some of this rock that's left up here is smooth. That isn't a cut from the DOT. That's actually the way it sheared off. And this rock does crack uh, fairly easily. Um, it's not brittle, but it, it, it's, it, it is brittle, but it isn't brittle. It doesn't shatter um, if, you, if you hit it with a hammer, but it will shatter in a situation like this. So what happened was the earthquake came and busted a bunch of it off. And I mean, it must have been a five foot piece five foot thick piece going all the way up here and it moved oh a gap about like about like that uh, and it just sat there for a while now I don't know if we had another earthquake or whether the uh, the layer and I'll tell you now I'll, I'll cut in this uh, I, uh, what I shot a little bit ago about the, um, the, the what looks to be the Chicxulub ash layer now this black layer that you can see undercutting the overhanging rock uh, I've picked up some pieces of that. It's all pulverized right here right now and you notice it goes up because the land kind of sweeps up then it disappears behind the rock. But if you notice that is about where the rock has sheared off and fallen here at this rock fall. And that to my eye appears to be the ash layer from the um, meteor impact. Remember, we're very close to Chix Chicxulub right here. So that meteor, when it hit, it, it instantly incinerated all the jungle and all the animals that were here into this ash layer. And that's not a real stable. It's like a charcoal or a coal uh, uh, base. It's not real stable. And then over 65 million years, all these rocks came on top of it and all it took was the earthquake to knock them loose. At least that's what I think and if I find out different from Sol Ross University I'll um, I'll cut that in later. But apparently it sheared pretty much along where that Chicxulub ash layer was so in other words this rock up here wasn't firmly attached to this rock down here it had that Chicxulub layer and that apparently is where it fell. Now what happened what I mean you could have had a huge big truck that went by could have been another earthquake, could have been just nothing, but it fell, came down, tumbled out in the road. They started moving it all aside. I stopped when it first came down and couldn't find any decent rock right away. Then when they came with the front end loader and started moving stuff around, they've exposed a lot of beautiful rock that I can use both for building and for flagstones. So that's what we're going to be picking today here. Now, I want to make a, I want to point out to everybody that most states it is illegal for you to go on those highway right-of-ways and pick rocks. That's illegal. You're not supposed to do it. Texas included. Some states are quite fussy about that. Utah and Colorado and I'm sure some of the New England states are quite fussy about that. And the reason is you don't want to be I mean you can get people out here that are that, that start mining and they start forgetting that they're not just picking up loose rock. They say, oh, I like the look of that rock. And they could undermine the foundation of the road. They could, they could uh, hit a ca underground cable. Uh, they could start diverting water. You know, it, you really, they, that's the reason. But if you call the state DOT in those states and you ask them, what about a rock fall? 
almost every one of them, and I've had never had a state say no to me, almost every one of them will say, look, if it's a rock fall, it's still illegal, but nobody's not really going to bother you if you're just picking from the rock fall. So I do have DOT's blessing to be picking from this rock fall here. And there are some excellent rocks here. Most of them have wonderful faces for building with. Uh, and then maybe one in 15, one in 20 has a beautiful face to use as flagstone. So we're going to start picking some of that up. And hopefully I'll get someone that I know to come by because this rock right here, I don't know if you can see it. I want that rock, but it's probably, it's probably a, around a 300 pound rock. Uh, it's a little much for me to move. Uh, I can bring it here, but I don't know that I can pick it up today. Uh, some days I can, today I can't. But I'm going to wait for somebody to help me with that. In the meantime, I'm going to start picking these rock along here, and uh, we'll get this video going. Oh, I'm taking a break. So you might ask me, how do you know what rock to take? How do you know which ones are going to work and which ones aren't? Well, here's where you get into a little bit of zen. You sit here and you look at them. You just kind of look at what's out there, what's available. Listen to the silence. Of course, the car is coming. He's about a mile away now. But you listen to the silence. And pretty soon the rocks, they start talking to you. That's a stupid thing to say, but almost everything will talk to you if you give it enough time. Fish will talk to you if you're fishing, that's for sure. So the rocks pretty much tell me. That's why I want that one. Now, I already dropped it on my foot once. You just sit and look. Then they start jumping out at you. All right, I got a few in mind, but I'm gonna turn this off and load them up. Well, I've had about a day full of collecting rocks. Um, didn't get as many as I'd like because I had a visit from one of those, those people. Every neighborhood's got one of those people that wants to come and talk at you for an hour. Well, that's what I just had. But I wanted to show you, I picked up this. Um, this is, came from what I call the Chicxulub layer. Now, that, that's not an official name by any means, but it's just that, uh, it's that, that layer of debris. And I picked this up because I wanted to show everyone the, the... I'm looking back here trying to figure out how to say it, but this is what all this rock was sitting on. And look at, look at what I'm doing. I'm crumbling this. All of this rock. Even this stuff behind me over this way that's got a lot of cracks in it that could actually come down if there's another trembler is all sitting on this. And look at how easy this comes, just comes to pieces and just falls apart. So uh, I am actually going to take some of this home because I want to see um, I want to see if it's got if it's if it's flammable in any way. It doesn't look like coal to me, but I don't really come from coal country, so I don't know. But um, I thought I'd just show you that, and that's kind of what caused this. Now, getting back to masonry, when you're picking rocks uh, and you don't know much about um, about masonry, I mean, a guy that's going to build his very first rock wall is building his very first rock wall, so he doesn't know. So they go for these chunky monkey rocks. They'll go for a big old square rock like this and try to stack them and stack them and stack them, and pretty soon they get up, you know, about this high, and there's no stability. Now, that doesn't mean you can't build a freestanding rock wall, but it's just the way that you think you're going to do it when you get these chunky rocks like this, it doesn't quite work that way. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next steps here is how to take a rock like this, and you notice that sharp edge there? Nothing's going to sit on that edge. Nothing's going to balance anyway. I'll show you how we make it just as stable as this chunky rock. There's a way to do it in the, um, in the design of the rock. So what that means is you don't worry so much about the shape as you worry about the face. 
So I look for a rock face. This rock, this is its face. You could use that as a face, but this is much bigger. So you look for a face and you don't worry so much that you've got a pointed edge here because I'll show you in the next segment how we're going to work with that. And remember I said that I sat and let the rocks talk to me and then you and as they're talking um, you spot rocks that kind of just catch you just right. For example, you go for color. Notice that's very, very thin. That won't matter at all as we put it in the rock. It's very thin. I've got that pretty orange color to it. Same thing here. I've got a sharp edge, but I've got a, actually a choice of faces. The same thing here. I've got a real nice face, but I've got a real knife edge there. We're going to get into that. Right now we've got our rocks. Uh, and I'm going to go home and get everything set up and hopefully we can, um, hopefully I can impart some of the limited knowledge that I have about uh, uh, doing masonry with raw native rock. Oh, so this is stone masonry 100 to 199 so we're going to cover all the basics now we already covered the basics of finding your material and of course um you know your material can be uh it can be a manufactured rock it can be uh, block it can be bricks or it can be native rock like i showed you now the other thing is what are you going to stick it together with you're going to are you going to stick it together with a mortar mix or are you going to make your own mortar mix? You're going to make a cement mix, which is really stiff and can crack. Uh, what are you going to do and how are you going to do it? Well, if you go, I went online just before I checked this. I went online to Home Depot and priced out mortar mixes. A mortar mix at Home Depot is $4.55 for a 60-pound uh, bag. Now, this is roughly how much uh, dirt, how much sand is 60 pounds. I know that because I lift these every day, three to a mixer load. Now, in that, in that, your main ingredient, your binding ingredient, rather, is your Portland cement. Now, you have six pounds of Portland, whoa, now you got five. You got six pounds of Portland cement. In the um, in that bag of mix for four dollars and fifty five cents. So you just start doing the math. That's a small little bucket. It's going to do oh I don't know uh, forty bricks maybe uh, to, uh, maybe thirty block um, or twenty five block. It's not going to do a lot. So you start going four fifty five times ten is forty five dollars and fifty cents times a hundred is four hundred and fifty five dollars. Uh, so it gets kind of pricey and this is what stops a lot of people is because they start doing the math and saying okay well if I buy ready mix cement in a bag I need roughly one cubic yard that's kind of the magic numbers one cubic yard for whatever you're gonna do with cement in a DIY project it's gonna take me what is it 16 bags 16 times five bucks you know it's a lot it, it gets to be kind of pricey um, but that little bit of Portland there probably cost me um, 75 cents. See, I buy the Portland is Portland cement in a 92 and a half pound bag. So 92 and a half pounds cost me 9.95 or up to 11 bucks if I were to buy it locally down here. Uh, but you know, say, say 10 bucks. Cost me 10 bucks for 92 pounds. That's a lot cheaper, and all I have to do is mix my own. Now, yeah, that can be a little bit difficult, but if you're also doing concrete like I am, I'm doing a lot of concrete work, and here's a big caveat, you have to have the sand available to you. Now, this soil I have here, and I'll show you in a minute, it's a mix of sand and adobe, and it's almost the perfect mix of adobe clay to sand. In other words, if you had much more adobe, you'd have something that wanted to crack all the time and wouldn't set up right. 
Uh, sometimes it gets a little light and I can add a little bentonite clay to it, but I don't want to add too much. You want your sand and mortar mix. I put lime in so that the lime absorbs water and then gives it out slower and dries slower. The slower you can get cement, concrete, mortar to um, um, concrete. Cement is a dry powder. The, but the, the, um, the, the slower you can get it to dry, the stronger it is. So what I do and what you saw me do is I shovel uh, because I've got that soil available. I shovel it into my screen. I've done this in other videos. I put a lot more in usually. Massage it through the quarter inch holes. Dump it over here. And I've got my um, my rock for um, uh, for making concrete with. It'll make a good strong concrete. Or I can put dump it right back in the hole over here. Now what I'm left with, and I'm going to bring this over and show it. What I'm left with is not just a sand and... Um, uh, adobe mix but you'll see you can see in there any little pebbles that are under a quarter inch get mixed in here now your purists and some of your stonemasons out there will say well yeah that's not a mortar mix and you're absolutely right it's not a mortar mix it's more of a concrete mix so I mix a little bit more um, Portland in with this your ideal mixture is going to be six to one and that's what that bag has is six to one that's what i showed you so i do oh seven ish to one something like i don't do i don't increase it a whole lot but i increase the portland just a little bit and i've got some out here i've done seven years ago some uh, bottles that that are just perfect there's no cracks i do have some cracks and you'll see them in some of the videos those cracks are more where the um uh, where, where the footing slipped a little bit and it doesn't affect the actual structure of the building. But anyway, I'm left with all this, mix that up to make my mortar, uh, and that way I can get one bag of, um, one bag of Portland, one ten dollar bag of Portland is going to net me three and a half mixer loads. Three and a half mixer loads and there's about three and a half of those buckets in there. So three and a half times three and a half is what? Nine, eleven, eleven and a, nine, ten and a half. Um, so ten and a half of those bags for one bag of Portland for ten bucks as opposed to forty-five bucks. And I get a different mix, a stronger mix that I'm doing all out of my native, um, my native soils here. So that's getting the mix together. If you have to use a mortar mix, and you know, and, and a lot of you people, you know, when I talk about being tight with money, a lot of you folks, and, and seriously, you make enough money that it isn't a big issue for you, and you can buy the bags, and, and you know, fine, skip all this crap. But for those that are trying to, um, uh, first of all, live on a budget, and second of all, use as much native material as you can, that's why I'm showing you this. Now the next step is going to be, and this is this is one of the tasks I absolutely hate around here, is screening this. And you saw, because I do have a little bit of trouble. I happen to be in a bad spot for this video. But it is a little tr troublesome, even though this dirt's already been loosened up and moved for me. Uh, but I hate this job. I hate it with a passion. And I have to do it... Um, about once every six days, five to six days, uh, and I spend the whole day just screening this and dumping it until I get my area completely full, then I go back to making the uh, masonry. So the next phase in this is going to be um, actually doing some masonry work and showing you how we do a, um, a stone wall uh, the correct way, and also how I do my bottle walls the correct way, the way that is going to work the best for me to get my, um, my, my heat transference through the walls the way I want it, uh, in order to stop it where I want to stop it. And we'll show you that in the next segment that's just going to blink through here, and hopefully, I, hopefully I'm hopefully i editing it okay. Well, the lighting in here is hideous, and I won't know until I edit it whether you can see me or not, but this shadow here, hey, it's me. So, what I have to do here, uh, although the title of this is Stone Masonry, what I have to do here is I have to do some bottle work before I can get to the stone. And I'll explain to you why real quickly. However, what I want to show you about mortar texture doesn't matter whether I'm using bottles or stone at this point. 
But here, if you look here, what I have is I've got some different levels to the bottles. So I have to, um, this is going to be a bottle wall here that has to go all the way up. Now that has no effect on doing stonework. The stonework starts right about here. So, as I've said before, but not in this video, when you're building a stone wall, you are not building a stone wall. That's the thing that I didn't understand, and that's the thing that's so simple. Once somebody explains it to you, you hit yourself in the head and go, oh, well, now I know. You're building two walls. You're building an outer stone wall and an inner stone wall. And they can be anywhere from, you know, right on top of each other to eight feet apart, depending on how much thermal mass you want. What you do is you lay one side, the other side, then you fill it in with dirt to bring it up, dirt or fill, whatever, whatever you got, really, to bring the, um, to bring the dirt level up to the level of the uh, rocks. And I'll get into it a little tighter in a few minutes. Uh, and then you fill, you know, you're filling it in. Then your rock, your next rock, will sit on top of that dirt. And you're going to put mortar in and it'll sit on top of that dirt. And I'll go into a little more detail. But at any rate, we're starting, and you will be starting if you're doing it yourself, we're starting with a uh, wall that's been set up and cured for a while. So the first thing you want to do when you have a wall like this that you're going to work on is you want to wet down. Now those electric boxes are getting wet, but I haven't connected anything yet. I just ran the wires. You want to just wet down what you're going to be working on. You want that water to soak in. I'm going to wet it down again before I actually put the mortar on it. I'm actually going to be working over here for right now, so we're going to wet this all down. Let that water soak in. It's not going to reanimate the, 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 the Portland, but what it does is it just makes for a better bond. So we're going to do, we're going to wet that down. I'm going to bring the mortar over. I'm going to bring the mortar over and then I'll, I'll show you the textures of the mortar. Well, if that first little segment didn't uh, didn't light up properly, I can see that this one did. But uh, uh, we're going to talk about textures on mortar. Now, whether you use a pre-bagged mortar or you mix your own like I do, what I'm about to say, it's all the same. It, 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 it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. There are essentially, what I've found and what I have used here are three different textures of mortar. Now, some of you stone masons or brick masons out there will, you know, might argue the point a little bit, uh, but, but stick with me on this and I'll explain it. You have three textures of mortar. You've got a mortar that you use on brick and block, and that's a mortar that's thick enough to stand up so that it doesn't fall off when you, um, when you butter your brick. I've got a fire brick here, and this is buttering the end here. So I've got that end buttered. Now see, it's not falling off. So that's the texture you want for brick and block. If it's too thin, now if I go around the edge here, I got some on the edge. If it's too thin, of course, it doesn't cooperate because it's on camera. But if it's too thin, it'll come off. Plus, you can see the texture on this is, God, I don't know, it's, it's really, really thin. So we're not going to use this fire brick. But that's a brick texture. Now, the texture that I just used on the end, that's what I would call my bottle texture. Now, that means I use this if I've already laid a course of bottles, it's still soft, and I'm laying another course on top. I'm going to use this because I, I, in order to spread it between the bottles, I don't have to um, use as much force. And bottles are light as compared to a stone or a brick or a, a block. So the bottles will move. So I'll use a thinner texture for the bottles. Now we won't get into that, but roughly the thinner texture is going to be this right here. And that came from around the edge because I keep my mixer wet on the very bottom. Uh, and then I pull from the middle when I'm going to be uh, laying, the, um, laying the mortar. But this is a proper texture for your um, brick and block. And it's also a proper texture for me to use when I've got a hard set uh, layer here that I'm going to start building on. This is already wetted down. Now the third texture uh, is a thicker texture even than that. It's it's um, oh it's it's more like I'm trying to figure. I, I can't really think of what 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 to call it, but it's much. It's got to be thicker than this, and I will show you in the next segment. 
uh, and the reason for that is you want something that will support the weight and not gush out. Now, if it gushes out, it's okay because you're. I'll show you how we're preparing for that. But you don't want it all to gush out immediately, so you want a thicker texture. The downside is the thicker it is, the faster you have to work. Because you can't add water to mortar. Okay, masons, yes, you can add water one time, a little bit of water. But you only have about a half hour from the time you mix this to the time that you're starting to run into problems. Now, a lot of folks don't understand why. In mortar, there's a chemical reaction that takes place with that crushed, uh, well, with the, with the Portland, which is cooked limestone, essentially, cooked crushed limestone. There's a chemical reaction that takes place once you add the water to it and all the other ingredients. And that chemical reaction is what hardens it up. The water content stays the same. The water is not drying out. The water content stays the same, but it hardens up. It gets rock hard. Then over the course of a day, two days, a month, or more, sometimes years, that water will eventually leach out and you'll have a good solid, essentially a rock. So it, when you start that chemical reaction, once it's started, it's started. You can't stop it. You can't restart it by adding water. Now you can add water and mix it up and it will look good, but the chemical reaction's not the same. And let's liken it to, to, um, let's liken it to baking a cake. You, you, you mix up a cake, you put it in the oven for 15 minutes, and it's starting to cook around the edges and that, and you say, wait a minute, oh, oh I want to mix it again. Take it out, try to mix it again. Well, half of the egg is already cooked, uh, the shortening or butter or whatever you've used in there is set up in there. You're not, you can't undo that chemical reaction of cooking the egg. Same thing with a pancake. You pour a pancake on the griddle, then you come back in 20 seconds and say, wait a minute, I'm, I mean, I want to take it off and remix it. You can't uncook what you've already cooked. And this is your cooking. So you can't uncook what you've already cooked. So if you add water, you're weakening the mixture. Now you can add a little water one time if it gets a little too thick to work with. You're still weakening the mixture a little bit, but it shouldn't be too much. The pro where people run into problems is they say, well, I'll just make it look the same. They make it look the same by adding a lot of water, but the strength is gone. You want to be very careful of that. That's a, You're cooking this. You're making a pancake. You're cooking this, and you can't uncook it to start over again. Once you put that pancake on the griddle, you're done. You've got to use it. And a little bit of water to make it a little pliable, yeah, you might, you lose, you might lose 5 to 10% of the, and I'm guessing, 5 to 10% of the structural strength, but you can, in order to not waste it, you can go ahead and stretch it that way. But you can't just add water arbitrarily. That's a worst mistake beginners use. We've even got a guy around here that's a really an excellent stonemason. The guy does really nice work, but he has this habit of adding water two and three times, and so his work starts to crumble after a bit. You don't want to do that. So that, ex um, that gets into the mortar a bit. Um, now I'm going to lay the mortar course out for this. You don't have to watch me do that, but I'm going to get it all set up and we'll come back with a little more information, I guess, on, um, uh, on, on the, um, the third type of mortar, my real stiff mortar for the rock. And we'll get into that and how to set rocks in a minute. But this was quite important. Probably the most important thing I can tell you about setting any kind of brick block bottle or brick block bottle rock. I knew I left something out is getting your mortar right and not weakening it by adding water. I'll come back in a couple minutes. Oh, you just always want to attend. Okay, we are back for the last segment in this. We're going to call this, after all, instead of that silly name I came up with, uh, 100 to 199, just stonemasonry fundamentals. Uh, sometimes I... Sometimes I think too much and get stupid. So stone stonemasonry fundamentals, and finally we're down to the stonemasonry. Now you can see here that I um, yesterday I took the bottle wall up so that the bottle wall, which if you just picture this as being another rock wall, the other of the two rock walls instead of bottles. I brought it up, so now you can see how it could give me some support or the ability to support from the back. And that's really the, the key to making a good stone wall is you're doing the two walls, and one gets high, and then one gets high, and then one gets high, and that's how you bring it up. Now, 
in between the two walls. You're going to fill it in with dirt, rock, uh, anything that's non, um, um, non-degradable. In other words, you don't want to put uh, you don't want to put peat moss in there. You don't want to put horse crap or dog crap because it might stink through. You don't want to put garbage in. You want to put stuff that's good and solid that won't um, that won't um, degrade. So. Uh, in your case, you're probably going to put rock, or, or you, can, you can put aluminum cans, whole or crushed, in there. I happen to have, from um, be just before I got injured, I had these. Um, I had the opportunity to get these. There was a, um, a bentonite company near us that had gone bankrupt. The new people came in. Uh, I worked for them briefly until I was injured, and they had all this that they had no use for because the other company went bankrupt. So I took, uh, they had about 12,000 bottles, and I was going to use these as blocks to build in the house with. Now, engineering-wise, I was having a lot of trouble with it, but it didn't matter because I got injured, and by the time I was ready to work again, two years had passed, and these had sat in the sun, the cardboard had degraded, and the bottles that weren't in cardboard degraded. So um, I'm left with, essentially, you can see that just destroyed right there. That's what I was left with. But for me, in, uh, in, in filling in these walls, this stuff is perfect. I just take it like so and pour it in, and it gets in and it, uh, it filters through. Now, some of you are going to say, yeah, well, the bottles, you don't have caps on the bottles, so it's going to get into those bottle, uh, inside the bottles and create gaps. And that's true, and you don't really want gaps. But once you've got your mortar in, once you've got your mortar all set up and your mortar has set up, if what you initially put the mortar on compacts down or falls down, it doesn't matter because that mortar's not going anywhere. It's like building a bridge, uh, like building a bridge. Once you remove all the supports, the bridge is going to stay because you've got the mortar. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, um, in fact, let me show you this. This rock here. I like the shape of this rock for this spot right here. Now, you can't see from back there, but this has a sharp edge right here. This is only an inch and a half thick. This is about two and a half inches thick. So what we have to do is figure out how to put this knife edge here right there. Right there. And I've got another rock I'm going to also work with that's kind of a difficult rock. And I'll show you that. Now, let me mix up the mortar and uh, we'll get going. Well, before I show you the mortar, I thought I'd uh, give you a kind of a close up of, of between the two walls just so you can get an idea of it. Uh, the light's better today because of the angle. I'm shooting from behind, I'm shooting with the sun behind me. Now, here we are up close, just as I say, picture this as being another rock wall. And you can see how um, I've got that filled in with pieces of styrofoam. We got a new refrigerator and it was packed with styrofoam, so I jammed the styrofoam in there. I've got beer cans in there and the bentonite. And you have to be sure that you brush it off of the tops of the rock because it, it will It'll weaken the bond if you've got it right on the top. Now a little bit won't hurt, but a lot will. So that's the look. And I will show you how we do it in just a moment. All right, the tools are set up. You can see I've wetted down this rock. We're gonna work on this piece right here, which is that rock I showed you. Now. Number one, we're using that different texture. I can't find my tools. We're using that different texture of mortar. This mortar, come to you. I got a rock field in front of me. It's where I put all those rocks. This mortar you see is considerably, let me get it up in the camera here, it's considerably thicker than what I was using. And we need that because we need it to give some stability. So let me get my bigger, there we go. I think we'll just work with the six inch uh, putty knife. I use a six inch putty knife 
and I'll show you at the very end, I'll spend a minute on pointing. Uh, I do my pointing with a soup spoon. And I've used the same soup spoon now for uh, 10 years. Now, what I just did, you saw, was glomp that whole section up there. Now this rock, because it's kind of a pre precarious rock, I'm also going to throw some back here to tie to the brick, uh, or in the case of your wall, that would be your other your stone. Oops. Okay. So I've got that there. I'm, I didn't really measure the width of this rock, so I'm just going to put a little more right there. That should be enough. Now it probably won't sit, but let's see. Again. Here's the knife edge. That's what's going down. So you put it in there, and will it stay? Probably not. That's what this board is for. Now, you can see it's sitting up there. Also, you want to look at it vertically. Now, you can use a level, or what I'm doing is backing up here. Now, I have the width of this of the wall has gone in by two inches since I started down here. Most of that is from here, but some of it is from the front. So you always want to check your verticality, and you would want to use a six-foot level. Uh, if you were using all flat rocks, but some of these, can you see this one? I think you can. This one sticks way out, this one sticks out. They all have different, uh, they stick out differently. So you can't really throw a level on it. You almost have to eyeball it. Now why am I eyeballing? I'm going to go get my spoon. Now that rock is set perfectly. I don't want that rock to move. I want it right where it is right now. I've uh, got my spoon for pointing, even though it's way too early to point. I want to gently push some mortar in, where I've got some that gushed out. I want to gently point, push some mortar in here, right along where the seam is. And you want to leave a little extra in there, always. You don't want to clean the mortar out right away. Uh, because you want to be sure that you've covered all your gaps. And the best way to do that is to put too much in. If you put too much in, you know you've got your gaps covered. Now there. Now that's pretty good. We are look at this spot right here, and we can see that that spot, um, that particular spot, is not going to really take a rock. I just don't have, let me look real quick here. I have one sliver, but it's way too wide. So that's just going to end up being, now you could put, you get creative. I've got a lot of calcite rock around here where I could take a little calcite pebble and stuff that calcite pebble in there. But it's not that big of a gap. Now I don't know if you caught that just then. When I touched this, the rock moved a little bit. But we don't want that. Now also what we want, and uh, I've got to get a block to stand on. Um, now, I got the block to stand on, and I'm shooting this video with the wall up this high. I should be shooting it lower, but this is where the wall was. Where we're going today is as high as I can go without putting um, a scaffold up or um, uh, you getting the ladder. So this is, this is as high as I can run. Uh, so I'm glad we're able to at least do this. Now, you also want to be sure, and I've got my hand on the rock to make sure it doesn't move, from behind, you want to creep behind that seam behind, just as though it were a front seam, and just push that mortar in. Now that's all this rock's going to need. Don't want that gap to be too thick, because the next rock, we're going to find a rock and put it in there. The idea is that you're building a jigsaw puzzle, which you've probably already figured out. 
So you look at what size rock do I need? Well, let me grab one that caught my eye. In fact, we did, might just go ahead and use this one. This has got that black and green color to it. And this rock will fit right in there and fill my gap perfectly. So again, let's repeat this. Point. Now that's plenty of mortar, but remember that's not real stable. So now I want to look. We definitely want the black side out. Ideally, it would fit better like this, but I want that black side out. Now, do I want to do this with it? Do I want to do this with it? Or the way I had it originally? And I actually kind of like this. So let's put that in. Now, you see it's sitting. It wouldn't have sat. This is a knife edge rock here. It wouldn't have sat had there not been the fill in the back. Now, I'm going to walk around out of frame. Double check my um, my verticality. This has to come out about three eighths of an inch. And I always throw my stuff down and forget where I do it. Did anybody see um, see where I put the little trowel here? It is. All right. I want to bring it out just a touch. That wasn't even three eighths of an inch, but that's as far as it can come and still point properly. And that's another thing. If you have an issue where it's not, um, the rock is, is um, you have an issue where the rock is not quite right, maybe it has to come out three eighths of an inch. If you can't make that up on one rock, make it up on two or three because you don't want your errors to be too obvious. And one thing I've noticed here on YouTube is YouTube is patrolled by trolls. That's what you guys call them. I never knew they were trolls. They're patrolled by trolls. Now I imagine a troll to be about 400 pounds in a t-shirt, a muscle t-shirt, um, living in his mother's basement, cruising around looking for things to say. He'll find a mistake, a real mistake that somebody's making, and he'll make a nasty comment about that mistake. Now, he doesn't have the ability to jump off of his butt and do it himself, but he damn sure can tell me how to do it. So I don't want that troll either on the inter on, on YouTube or in person. You know that troll lives in person? He's the guy that comes to your house and he walks around and he looks and he finds the one mistake you made in the project. He doesn't say a word, he just touches it. Run like hell from that guy. Get away from him. You don't want him as a friend because he's an idiot. He doesn't realize 99% of the beauty that you did. He sees the 1% that's a mistake, and he's got to point it out to you. That's not a mistake, by the way. So, we got two rocks in, and I got a full mortar, uh, a full wheelbarrow of mortar. So I'm going to do some more. Actually, I'm going to reset because there was one other one other problem I wanted to show you that I think you'd be interested in. So let me reset. All right, I'm going to be pretty much out of frame on this. You can hear me jabbering. Now, I have this rock here that I'd like to put here. And I've only got just about three inches here. Not even three, probably two and a half. I'd like this rock to sit right here like this. That's where I want it. Now, I'm not so sure I can do it when I'm using the board over there to hold the one rock up. But what I'm going to do is butter this. Now, I don't have any, any concrete ties here. Uh, the concrete ties from the back, which I've got to put some here now, the concrete ties from the back will tie into this mortar and hold it. And I'm going to put some ties in this when we're off camera. But I'm going to try to put this in. So let's butter this up. And different parts of the world, of the country, have different terms for uh, stone masonry. Uh, buttering it up appears to be, and somebody correct me, if you're a mason, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but buttering it up seems to be a Midwestern or at least a Michigan term. Uh, Debbie's father, who built, um, him and his brothers built, and father, built homes in the 1950s. Uh, he always called it buttering, so I call it buttering. 
Um, he taught me quite a bit about masonry, but he didn't know that much about it. He was a hard, uh, a hard boy, because he was the youngest brother, so he was a hard boy. And a hard boy carried the uh, brick and mortar, and that's all a hard boy did. Now, I can't guarantee this rock is going to go, but let's just give it a shot. Now, the issue I have here is it needs to be not quite flush. Now, it's already wanting to lean here. You want it to be not quite flush with, um, with this board. So you got to run your fingers down here. All right, I got to put it there. Now, that's where it's got to sit. It's not going to sit there. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing in. See, and if you push in this big, thick mortar mix, it will hold. But see, now, as soon as I let go, it's gone. So, now I don't have anything that will span it, so we'll try another trick here. We're going to load it up with mortar. Sometimes you do have to load it up with mortar. Now, the issue is it's wanting to chip this way. So, if I get a chip, Embed that chip, then replace the stone. Give it as much opportunity as you can to stick. Now, pushing on the back, you can't see because my back's to you, but I'm pushing this up on the back to the board and to the rock. Now by doing that, I'm actually creating a little bit of adhesion. Not enough to hold this rock in place on its own in one spot, but when you go all the way around, you've got enough to hold the rock in place. When I set one right next to it, that will lock this in better. I didn't say that. They'll lock together. Uh, it's not like glue, but it's just that adhesion, that cohesion from the um, surface tension, I, I'm not sure, I'm not a physics expert, but anyway, it'll hold together. Now I can walk away from this. And I'll come back when I finish this load of mortar. And there we are, a quick rudimentary uh, fundamental lesson in, in stone masonry. Now, we still have a couple of things to do. I'm going to come back and show you how I point with that spoon because pointing is every bit as important as anything else you do. If you don't do the pointing right, first of all, it'll look like crap. Second of all, the rocks may not stay in place. Rocks, bricks, mortar. The pointing's quite important. You can see we set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rocks. Now, I can do more, but working at this height, and I purposely saved this so I could show you that knife edge. Um, I can do about 25 a day uh, is, is about it. And remember, I'm also working up high. I should be on the scaffold. But anyway, we'll come back and show you the uh, pointing. And I've got some other masonry to do that um, I'm not going to show you. We'll do the pointing and finish this thing. Well, we're finally ready to do the pointing on these rocks. Now, I was going to discuss pointing and jointing and the difference. Problem is, I have a lovely, lovely wife that sometimes comes in and straightens up my, my tools and my um, things for me. And guys, you know where I'm going. When I say my wife straightens it up, you know exactly what I'm going to say. The jointing tool is nowhere to be found. Where I left it, it isn't. So anyway, I can't show you the jointing tool, but it's long. It's about like that, that long. It's shaped with a little bend in it. It's U-shaped. You're going to use a jointing tool or a joining tool when you're doing block and brick. And joining and pointing are pretty much the same, but they're not exactly the same. If we had a straight line here and I had the jointing tool, you have a straight line because we've got brick or block, and it's a narrow line. It's going to be about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch or a quarter to a half inch. And you simply take the joining tool, run it along there and you're just pushing the mortar and like I said I do with pointing. You're pushing the mortar and then if there isn't quite enough mortar you take a little bit on the end of it and push it in there. The joining tool will run along the gaps on brick and block just exactly like it needs to be done. It makes a real perfect clean line 
it's nice. I've used it when I've done um, brickwork and block work, and it's really nice. Now, I had a tough time. I couldn't use um, a joining tool on um, masonry when I started. And I could, the only thing I could find was the soup spoon that you've seen me use. So that's what we're going to do here. And I'm going to zoom in on the, on the first rock we put in. And I'm going to go ahead and point and joint. Now, jointing or joining is simply pushing it in when it's fresh, when it's new. At the same time, I'm pointing as I'm joining it. Now, if you've already got existing uh, block or raw, uh, bricks or mortar, black. Block, block bricks, rocks. If you already got existing stuff, but for whatever reason the mortar has come out or looks like crap, and you're going to want to freshen that mortar up a bit, you'll take and you'll scrape out some, and then you'll take fresh mortar with your joining tool and you'll put it in. That is actually what pointing is. You're pointing it, you're making it look pretty. So we're going to joint and point here. So let me zero in on that and you can get an idea of what I do and then I'll show you the, the, the finished, um, the whole finished wall. Alright, now you're zoomed in. You're not going to see me but you can watch my hands. Now what we have to do is we've got to, we've got to both join it and point it. So you want to go ahead and work on that seam. And what you're doing is you're doing just what it looks like I'm doing. You're pushing on the mortar. What you're doing is taking out any space, you're packing it in. Now you have to wait. I waited about an hour and a half. And you want to wait until your mortar is about the, the mortar that you put in here is about the consistency of a piece of margarine that's been in the refrigerator. Not in an icy refrigerator, but in a normal refrigerator. You take it out, you know you can spread it, but you're not going to spread it on Wonder Bread, but you can spread it if you've got a good if you've got something hard there. So we're using this, it's about that same texture, and the first thing I'm doing is just kind of pressing in the joint. Pressing in on that joint. Just to be sure I've got it where I want it. There aren't any gaps. So, that's the way you would start. Of course, you want to, any rock that you set that's adjacent, you're also pointing that at the same time because you're pointing the entire seam. Now that's pressed in. Now what I do, is we're doing dealing with rock, now I scrape along until I get to the edge of the rock. And I'm scraping the excess out. Now you can know you can get down here and you can catch it. And you know, put it somewhere if you'd like. You're taking off any excess you've got. Now, you have a choice. And, and, you know, mortar work is like carpentry, is like almost anything that's artistic. Uh, and, and everybody's got their own style. The gentleman that taught me what I know about rock work, what little I know, he had a way of, he would, uh, he would take his joints down, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter inch, he would take his joints down to make the rock pop out at you. In other words, you're scraping off the excess mortar until you're, until you're down about a quarter of an inch. Now, I go about three-eighths of an inch. That's just what I tend to do. Uh, and that makes the rocks pop. There is absolutely nothing wrong with leaving it flush like this, doing your jointing and leaving it flush. You get that rustic kind of colonial look to it when you do that. I prefer to see the rocks pop. I'm doing rock work because I like it. So what we're going to do is now that I've gone ahead and exposed, I've gone ahead and I've exposed the edge here, I'm going to go back through and make sure I've got it exposed. Now it's a little uneven, so this is where you have to look at it and say, okay, what am I going to do? 
So I'm going to start right here on this rock, which is not the one that, that we placed first. And I'm going in my quarter inch roughly here. Now the reason I started with this rock is it's the one that's a little bit more forward at the joint. They're, they're both pretty much level with each other, but being rock is irregular. This was the one to start with. Now then I just take the excess, if there is excess, and try to spread it. And you see that seam is starting to come along there. A little difficult right here because the rock goes in, and that's fine. I just won't try too hard because if you try too hard, it looks like you were trying too hard. Right, there's my seam. Now, you can see that I'm able to spread this like cake frosting. If you can't spread it like cake frosting, you might have something on the back of your joining tool. Uh, the mortar itself might be a little dry, so you would spray a little water on it or spit on it. I'll spit on it because I'm too lazy to get a sprayer. Now you see, this one end of the joint is pretty much done. Then I go on here. Now this rock did push down to the one below it, so I have a real narrow um, uh, mortar joint right here. I got about a quarter inch down here. And with that, uh, you can't get even the spoon in there. You're never going to get a jointing tool in there. Okay, there's my rock, the top of my rock here. And I see there's quite a gap there, so you're going to work that gap down. Let's just concentrate on this one seam because I forgot how long it takes me to joint properly and I don't want to rush myself because the camera's on. So I outline the top like that and I just kind of, I may be putting three or four pounds of pressure on the spoon as I'm going up like that. Alright, now this joint is pretty much done. Now I did say there's a quarter inch over here. I'm going to just jump right over here because I don't want to make this any longer than it already is. Luckily I can get this in and join it, but if I couldn't, I would get my finger good and wet and just run my finger in there. It's not going to look as smooth with your finger. But when you're doing stuff like this, you do it. Don't try to make it perfect. It's just like this. When you set your rock and you don't, you know, you, you think, well, do I need a little more mortar? If it's sitting still, don't put any more mortar on it. Because the minute you start to put more mortar on it, you're going to do something to make it come loose. That's what I did over here. That's why I have to clamp it. Usually if it sits, it sits until joining time. This is where you make all your corrections. You're going to put straighten your rock. Not straighten your rock, you're not moving. But you're going to tighten your rock in. So I'll come back when I finish joining this whole, all 13 of these, uh, I think that's what I put, all of these that I placed today. Show you the well, it's done! Finally! I started this on Wednesday and today is Monday, so it's taken me quite a while to get this video together. Uh, I, and, and to do this. So anyhow, we are done. I want to give you a close-up of the pointing, the finished pointing, and I want to remind you one more time, because I can't say it enough, the most important thing that you can do is your jointing and pointing. If you're doing masonry work and you know you have this much energy in a day, 
You don't wait until you're tired to stop setting brick and block and then say, okay, I'm done, except for the pointing. You've got to save energy for the pointing. You've got to take as much time as it requires. You can't do a shortcut because it's going to look like crap. Now, this kind of a wall is an organic looking wall. It looks like something from nature, or so it should. And there's no straight lines in nature, so there's no straight lines in the wall. But let me, uh, let me show you what my joint, my final pointing looks like, and um, thank you. And that will be the end. So let's start with the troublemaker. He's still clamped. I'm going to leave him clamped overnight. Then we move on to the big rock. You see how all those rocks are popping at you? You can see each individual rock. There's a big mortar gap, but that's okay. And then the last one I set was right up here. Now when I do a wall, I've got a um, kind of a trademark. And I guess almost every mason will have a trademark on the wall. Uh, one thing out here, one trademark I have is the fossil. There's a fossil in every wall somewhere, sometimes two, but there's a fossil. Or, or if there's not a fossil, there's a rock that's just so out of place that you can't you, you, you can't miss the fact that it's out of place once you see it. The other one is the mystifier. That's the mystifier. How did I get that 250 to 300 pound rock up there that high? Now we all know there's ways it can be done, but I always put a mystifier up high about eye level and that's about eye level. And then of course the depth of the pointing is my trademark. And that's how it looks. Now to finish this wall out and all these walls, um, you're going to um, spray them down with muriatic acid, give them a scrub, and we'll rinse them very good. And that'll remove all the uh, mortar and um, cement debris and also any other debris that might be there. Now I know it was long. The chickens are getting restless. So we'll end it here. I hope I gave you some good knowledge on how to begin the fundamentals of stonemasonry. And the only way you're going to get better is to do it. But at least I've given you some of the fundamentals, a couple of the tricks. I don't want to call them secrets, but a couple of the tricks. And hopefully you gained something from it. So until next time, next video, it's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas. See you later. Hi. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my video. I'm going to be putting this little tag at the end of every video. You know, when Debbie and I started this journey into sustainability in uh, 2002, uh, the idea was to preach to other baby boomers that were, that were in their last 10 years of work on how they can l retire with dignity. Well, it stretched out for so many reasons over 15 years, and here we sit. The baby boomers that are older than me are 70-ish, or pushing 70, and not all of them are in this kind of shape, so they can't get out and do it. So we're looking at uh, the X and the Y generation. Let's not call them generations. We're just looking at the younger folks now and saying, hey, you can do it too. You can live with dignity. And I want to finish this project. I'm sitting here in the chicken coop, the unfinished chicken coop, uh, right now. Now, Debbie and I live comfortably on our social security but we can't finish the project using the social security i need help from people that's why i put a donate button up in the upper corner of our um, uh, main page of the channel you can donate there uh, to help me finish this project uh, by making a donation through paypal there you can also make a direct donation to uh, through us or to us through paypal at robert at singingturkeys.com which I'm going to put in the runner here and mainly what I need to do is I need um, I need lumber to finish this roof with and I need mortar that's uh, not mortar but I need Portland Portland is the big thing we need I figure I need about 300 more bags of Portland they're ten dollars a bag so every ten dollars buys me one bag of Portland and keeps me busy for a good solid day uh, and I need your help 
if you're in a position to help. Uh, because I can't do it alone, I can only buy a few bags a month on our uh, Social Security. So I put this little tag in there to ask if you have the ability to help, help. If you, um, if you don't, hey, keep watching the videos, I'm sure you can pick up something. And help me out also in another way. Uh, and that is to pass around this channel to people you know that might be interested. Anyone you know that might be interested. Even a couple of billionaires that might want to donate a little bit of uh, money to help me finish the project. But I need a little help with it because 300 bags of Portland is a little expensive and that's what it's going to take to finish this. And I've got to run all this roof. I have the roofing. Somebody, somebody uh, uh, in our family gave us uh, the money to buy all the roofing. So I have all the roofing. I just don't have the lumber to put the, to put, um, the roofing on with. So that's why I'm putting this tag at the end of all my videos. If you're in a position to, give me a hand. If you're not in a position to, hey, pass the channel on to other people. Maybe they'd be interested, and maybe some of them might want to help a little bit too. Every 10 bucks brings me a day closer, and, you know, uh, let's say about 30, 35 stones closer to finishing. Thanks a lot for your help and for watching. There'll be other videos coming.